Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined as always by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. And Wes, we are back about three months ago, I think, was yeah. our last show. And uh, with this one, we will kick off season number nine. Season number nine. You've been putting up with me for eight years, Michael. <laughs> Can you believe that? Season number nine of Packers Unscripted as 2024 gets rolling here we have a lot to catch up on as far as a very very busy off season for the green bay packers but i'm not going to go in chronological order here because where i want to start is with what turned out to be a wild and crazy and frenetic first 48 hours or so of free agency in the middle of march during which time aaron jones david bakhtiari and devondre campbell were no longer Green Bay Packers, but two of the top prizes on the free agent market at their respective positions became Green Bay Packers. And of course, I'm talking about running back Josh Jacobs and safety Xavier McKinney. What were your thoughts on how those first couple days of free agency unfolded? Well, the interesting thing about the NFL, Michael, and the free agency time in particular is that you can never plan for anything. Uh, What you expect to happen isn't always what happens and honestly very rarely does. Uh, You were the one in Indianapolis listening to Brian Gutekunst, him talking about, yeah, we're expecting Aaron Jones back, trying to make something work. But even though, you know, Aaron is such a beloved player here, you can tell the amount of respect the coaches, the front office, everybody has for him. It's It's a game of finances and it's a game of money and Aaron doing what's best for himself and his family and the Packers trying to do what's best for them moving forward. So if you would have ever told me a scenario in which not only is Aaron Jones not going to be a Green Bay Packer in 2024, but Josh Jacobs, one year removed from being the NFL's rushing champion, yeah. an all pro, a two time pro bowler he ends up being the one that emerges out of free agency, uh, I would have told you you're crazy. I mean, when you look at it, Michael, the fact that it had been over 15 years since the last time, actually over almost 25 years since the last time the Packers had signed a running back as an unrestricted free agent, yeah. there has been a homegrown aspect to this thing. The Packers went out, they found a guy three years younger than Aaron, Coming off a you know a down season with the Raiders, but a lot of things that were working against him, a lot of inconsistency in that offense, that offensive line, the change with Josh McDaniels midseason. And now he's here in Green Bay, hoping that the stability really kind of propels him back towards being that all-pro running back that he was in 2022. Yeah, and you were down uh, just a couple weeks after the Josh Jacobs signing. You were down in Florida at the owners' meeting, and you heard from Matt LaFleur And as much as Matt LaFleur is sad that Aaron Jones is no longer a part of the Packers offense, he's awfully excited about getting Josh Jacobs in this offense. And both Jacobs, when he spoke to the media for the first time after signing his contract, and LaFleur speaking with the media down in Florida, they both talked about being more involved in the passing game, not just being that, you know, that bell cow running back, the workhorse that's going to get, you know, the 20 to 25 carries a game but it's about utilizing him even more in the passing game. Now, it's not that Jacobs hasn't been. He averaged, I believe, 40 receptions or so per season during his years with the Raiders. Um, But that's an aspect, I think, that uh, that Jacobs welcomes and LaFleur welcomes as far as, uh, uh, you know, getting him the ball in different ways like that. In different ways. And and you've seen the last few years the way the Packers use those running backs and Matt LaFleur when you get the multiple options. Certainly we've talked – numerous times about the pony package and being able to get two backs on the field and how being able to you know manipulate a defense with multiple looks but the thing that's the most incredible thing to me about Jacobs is he has 46 rushing touchdowns and not a single receiving touchdown during his career I mean everything as much as he's been a bell cow type back a guy that averages 300 touches a season throughout his five seasons with Las Vegas he, he hasn't had any of those, those receiving touchdowns. I think that's going to change in this offense. And as I wrote about in the pre-draft picture series that we're currently running on our website, it's not just going to be him. They were able to bring back A.J. Uh, Dillon. They also have Emmanuel Wilson coming back. There is a sense of familiarity with this backfield, despite the fact there's a new guy that's on the top of the depth chart. Yeah, when you look at the other big free agent signing for the Packers, this dovetails very nicely into the other really, really big piece of news in the offseason, which is that Jeff Halfley has been hired 
from his job as the head coach at Boston College to be Matt LaFleur's new defensive coordinator. Some other assistant coaches on the defensive side, uh, some new faces are coming in uh, to Green Bay as well. But when you look at, you know, Halfley and what, what he has said about his defense and the types of players that he's looking for, and specifically when it comes to how he wants to utilize safeties in the back end of the defense and what he wants, what he's going to demand as the defensive coordinator out of that position, Xavier McKinney, to use an overused phrase, checks all the boxes. And it was not a surprise at all, really, um, even though the Packers aren't normally this involved on the opening days of free agency. You have to go back to kind of 2019 yeah. uh, for the last time that, uh, that these sort of signings occurred. But, uh, but Xavier McKinney is a guy that the Packers feel not only fits this defense that Halfley's going to run very, very well, but also is a player that I think Halfley is expecting to showcase from a playmaking standpoint and give him opportunities to make some game-changing plays. Yeah, and as Brian Gutekunst told us in Orlando, I mean, it was a kind of a question there whether or not either him or Josh Jacobs would even make it to the free agent market because yeah. of the option with the franchise tag. When McKinney was there, he's, you know, Brian said it himself. I mean, that is an unusual player to be available. I almost liken it to the Shaquille O'Neal effect, not to put those at lofty of expectations on McKinney, but it's very rare that you see a guy that has been as productive as he's been and is only 24 years old when he reaches unrestricted free agency. I mean, as Brian said right from the get-go, they feel like his next three years are going to be his best seasons in the National Football League. We haven't even seen the best version of this guy yet. So when you're paying top dollar for a safety, it's one thing. Packers did it back in 2019 with Adrian Amos right. when they were really switching things up with that defense the first time. Well, now you not only get McKinney, who I think by and large everybody would agree was the top target for safeties on the market. You're getting him before he's even reached his prime. And I, I feel like for the Green Bay Packers, what they need from that safety position, all the, the ebbs and flows that they went through last year, injuries, inconsistency, if they're going to switch to this type of scheme where maybe you're going to see a little bit more of the single high look again, you need a guy that is going to be able to handle that patrolling of center field. You're going to need a guy that's going to be able to close quickly to the football. Jeff Halfley said it in his opening news conference. He wants a guy that's going to erase things on defense, and Xavier McKinney definitely does that. I think the – the thing that stuck out to me the most and continues to stick out to me the most with regard to McKinney is that last season he had 116 tackles and the various, you know, pro football focus metrics and, and whatnot, the, the analyses that are out there said that he only missed seven tackles, yeah. 116 tackles and only seven misses. And then when McKinney spoke to reporters for the first time after, after signing his contract, I actually I, I tried to ask him in a kind of roundabout way, well, what makes a good tackler? Like, how did you get so good at this when you can get 116 and only miss seven over the course of an entire season? And his immediate response was, the seven is too many. I've got to get that number down. This is a guy who's one of the better tacklers in the league, and yet he doesn't look at himself that way. He looks at it as, I still, ha I still have to get better. If I'm in position to make a tackle, I've got to make it. And Missed tackles, they're going to happen in the NFL. They happen to everybody. I think we've seen over the last couple of years that the Packers have had a few too many of them, and not just one person or one position, yeah. but it's been, uh, it's been kind of an across-the-board thing when things go, have gone a little sour on defense. And I think having a guy like McKinney as, as a leader, as a veteran guy who's, who's been there and done that, and then with this transition to the new defense, it seems like the right fit for everything that Halfley and LaFleur are looking for. And it's a high-wire act back there. Even if you're playing too high safety, it's not just that if you miss a tackle, it's what are the, rep the ramifications of that missed tackle. Yeah. And that's where I think when you mentioned a couple times Green Bay got kind of burned by that last year. It's not an easy position to play. For whatever reason, the NFL is kind of downgraded a little bit. People aren't willing to spend the money on safety like maybe they were 10 years ago. 
But you see the value in it when you look at a player like Xavier McKinney. He's versatile, and he's sort of that five-tool player that you really need back there. He can he can hit he can hit the you know the running back. He can be able to cover downfield by himself if he needs to. You saw those interceptions he had towards the end of last season against Philly. There's some instinctual things that he does along with that speed that he carries that's going to keep him in this thing for a long time. And I don't know what exactly is going to happen alongside of him. The Packers still have a big hole there as the safety two spot. Anthony Johnson Jr. is going to come back. Maybe they address it through the draft. Maybe there's a free agent out there that they like. But whoever that is, you have a pretty good feeling that McKinney is going to be able to work with that individual and help bring them along, much like what Adrian Amos did with Darnell Savage in 2019. Yeah, and to dive a little bit deeper deeper into the switch at defensive coordinator with Halfley coming from Boston College, numerically it's about going from a 3-4 to a 4-3, right? We don't want to overplay that necessarily. It does turn... Guys like Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, Lucas Van Ness into more traditional defensive ends. We will see if they play with their hand on the ground or whether they still stand. <laughs> Lucas up or, already is. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe, or maybe it's a you know it's a combination of things based yep. on what package you know down and distance situation, all of that. Um, the uh, what I am most curious about. I'll ask you what you're most curious about to see develop in this first year of Jeff Halfley's defense. For me. It's how is how does Jeff Halfley go about utilizing an athlete and a talent like Quay Walker? Because we saw Walker make some pretty good strides from his rookie year to his second year. We saw him in week one of his second season get a pick six at Soldier Field. But then, you know, not that I'm not saying he had a bad season. He was he was better in year two than I thought than in year one. But we didn't see a whole lot of the splash plays, the flashy stuff, the you know the the game changing type of plays. But Quay Walker is the kind of athlete in the middle of a defense who can make those kind of plays. Yeah. And I am very curious to see just how Halfley and his defensive assistants go about trying to showcase Quay Walker at the linebacker level, as we had talked about with McKinney at the safety level. I just felt like and it was one of the questions I asked Matt LaFleur after the season about when he was making this change where Joe Barry is out as defensive coordinator, he's looking for somebody else. Was he specifically looking to go to a 4-3 or was that a byproduct of the coordinator that you're picking? And it was a byproduct is what he said. He wasn't necessarily looking to make a change. But when I look at where Green Bay was last year, I look at their personnel There wasn't a lot there where I said, man, they really got to fix this. They have to do this differently. I just think sometimes when you're not getting the results, you need to switch things up. And I feel like this switch, and and again, I'm a guy that you can read, you've read all my stuff for eight years. I love the three, four. That's where I have always thought. But with some of the gap issues they had last year, some of the times where they got gashed with the run, I think sometimes you do need to try something different. So when I look at Quay Walker, bringing it back to your original point, I just think that this is something that's going to complement him well. He's going to be able to read those defenses. He's going to be able to act instinctually. He has a rapport there already with Isaiah McDuffie, who in some form or fashion is going to be incorporated into this defense, depending on what they do with that other inside backer spot. I agree. But overall, I feel like the construct is there. I feel like the bodies are there. I feel like the defensive line, they got a lot of production from that last year. The defensive line had almost half their sacks of those 45 with Kenny Clark having a career high, Devontae Wyatt having five and a half. And when you have somebody like Quay Walker who also can contribute in that fashion, I just feel like there's going to be a lot for Halfley to utilize there. And he was even asked about it during his original press conference. And he said, I mean, one of the first things you do as a defensive coordinator come into Green Bay, you look at Quay Walker and you like what you see. Yeah. And I think the scheme overall is something that's definitely going to benefit him in the long run. Yeah. When I look at these young guys on the Packers defense, obviously Kenny Clark is going to do his thing. Press Justin Smith, you know, is doing his thing. Rashawn Gary has certainly come into his own, even though he missed half a season, you know, with with a torn ACL. When I look at the young guys on this defense, the Quay Walker, Quay Walker and Devontae Wyatt and Isaiah McDuffie, I think Jeff Halfley wants to have these young defenders in attack mode, not yep. react mode. He wants to he wants to get something established where the defense the defense is attacking more often than it's reacting. You're going to have to play some situations reactionally on defense. That's the nature of the sport, it's the nature of the game. But the more times you can create situations and create opportunities to be on the attack and with as much young blood, so to speak, yeah. as the Packers are going to have on the defensive side of the ball, that's kind of in a general sense where I see this going. Yeah, and I agree with you. And I, and I think that's going to be exciting because 
We'll, we'll preview the draft a little bit later and we'll get going on how these things are going to shape up and the 2024 landscape is going to be. But Michael, with how many guys stepped up last season, with how many rookies contributed right away, I didn't go into this offseason thinking, man, Green Bay has a lot of holes to fill and they don't have a lot of draft picks. They don't have a lot of money. No, they have more money. They have more draft picks. Now they still got to build depth. They still have to find guys that can, can challenge for positions right away. They need to find that safety. But my goodness, Michael, when you compare what this conversation was like when you and I came back for the first episode of Unscripted last year, as opposed to where Green Bay is yeah. sitting today, it's a night and day difference. There's been a lot of guys that have contributed to that, but I just feel like for Jeff Halfley coming in, trying to implement his program, there are so many young stallions here for him to work with to hopefully build something that can become what everybody has expected this defense to be. Well, I want to go through other players that the Packers brought back, guys who left. We'll sort of uh, analyze a little bit where that is. But for some sponsor business first, Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7. 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 plus years of better. All right. Elsewhere in free agency, I'm just going to rattle off kind of the, the names as far as who's gone and who's been brought back. As far as who has departed the Green Bay Packers, safeties Darnell Savage and Jonathan Owens. Offensive lineman John Runyon and Yash Nyman. Tight end Josiah DeGuara and running back Patrick Taylor. Re-signed by the Green Bay Packers. Keyshawn Nixon, A.J. Dillon, Eric Wilson, Corey Ballantine, Christian Welch, and Robert Rochelle. Two things that jump out at me. One is that as we get asked a lot in Insider Inbox, almost inevitably as soon as a season ends and the free agent lists get out there, who's the top priority for the Packers to re-sign in free agency to make sure this guy doesn't get away? And I think you and I both answered the question exactly the same way. It was Keyshawn Nixon. Not only because of what he did in a full season as the nickel cornerback, and really for him playing that position full time for the first time yeah. in his career, I think the Packers feel like there's still some more growth and some more progress there, even though Keyshawn Nixon is not necessarily a young player anymore with his experience in the league. But then you throw in, obviously, what he brings to the return game and then what the owners passed at the owners' meetings as far as the whole new setup and the rules and regulations with regard to kickoffs that are going to promote kickoff return yeah. opportunities instead of as many touchbacks as we've seen in recent years. I thought the re-signing of Keyshawn Nixon was was a big move for the Packers in two phases, both defensively and on special teams. It was the biggest move Green Bay made. And, and because, let's just start with defense, because Jeff Halfley, this was another question that came up uh, throughout the offseason with Matt LaFleur. You know, they were the ones. Jeff Halfley comes in, as he talked about, his family's still in Boston. You know, he's sitting over here at Lodge Kohler, just basically living, breathing, and eating football every single day. Yeah. And he had a lot of time to crunch film. And a big part of that was watching the 900-some snaps that Keyshawn Nixon played last year and projecting whether or not this would be a good fit. Because if it isn't, this is the breaking point. This is where the Packers can let him walk and they can move forward in a new direction. Jeff Halfley looked at that film and said, this is promising for a guy that finally is a full-time player, full-time starter is in that role. He liked what he saw. And Brian Gutekunst kind of expounded upon that when we were in Orlando saying, you got to remember, it's not just about how you cover. It's about how you tackle. And you need a guy that's built for that contact. You need a guy that's sort of like this hybrid pseudo safety type position. And Keyshawn Nixon in a lot of ways fits that bill especially with his explosiveness. I think the Packers saw what he did last year. It wasn't error-free, but they felt like there's something to build off there now. And obviously the fact his durability is such a pivotal piece in Green Bay, and he was the guy that ended up being out there more than anybody with those cornerbacks. And if I may, just quickly with this kickoff return business, we'll have to see what this all is. You yeah. and I are going to have plenty of opportunities to discuss this this summer. Will it look different? Will it result in more explosive plays? Will it result in, result in fewer? Everybody's got a theory on this thing. Yeah. But all I'm going to say is with the moves that Green Bay made, and Keyshawn Nixon is a part of that, but he's not all of it. It's some of these Eric Wilson signings too. It is, if the Green Bay Packers are going to make this transition into this new season with this new format for the kickoff, you are as well positioned as you're going to be right now with having Keyshawn Nixon back there. Yeah, I think so too. And 
it is, it's going to be the big curiosity as far as uh, special teams across the league in 2024 with the implementation of this of this new kickoff, this modified version. But special teams in general, I thought I thought the Packers really helped themselves by bringing back these guys like Wilson and Ballantine and Welch and Rochelle, um, and also as far as that spotlight on special teams, there's a kicking competition yeah. here now. Anders Carlson, Jack Pudlesny was signed right after the season ended. And then the veteran Greg Joseph has been brought in. He's been the kicker for the Vikings for the past three seasons. So right now there are three kickers on the roster. I don't know how long that necessarily will continue, but one way or another, there's going to be a competition for the kicker position in Green Bay. So a lot of a lot of eyes on special teams and how some of this stuff is going to sort itself out as the Packers make their way towards week one. Well, and then this is something you got to keep in mind, too. I mean, kickers are going to have a role to play in this kickoff return business now as well, because if you if you're doing touchbacks and those sort of things, now it's coming out to the 30. If the opposing team wants to kneel it down or let it go through the end zone, uh, you have to make sure you hit it within the landing zone or otherwise it's going to be going to the 40. It's a difficult situation. I really felt when you and I were breaking down at the end of the season, we were talking about some of the issues that Anders had in that, that NFC divisional playoff game. I just felt like he's at a point right now where he can benefit for some competition. Now they didn't go out and, you know, pay Matt Gay all that money. Like, like the Colts did last year. Greg Joseph is more of that moderate type signing, a guy that's going to get an honest opportunity at winning that job, but you're not tied to him financially. Right. If it doesn't work out. Right. That's the thing I think is going to be very important for them because you look even like a Daniel Whelan last year, how much he grew throughout camp when he's competing with Pat O'Donnell for that job. And the only one person can win it. So I, I just feel like we're going to see the best version of Anders through this thing too. And and the Green Bay Packers talked about it the day that Rich Bisacci got hired. They were going to make a commitment. They were going to be more veteran-laden on special teams, and they've been a man of their word. A couple other topics to hit on before we go and sign off on our first show. Um, a lot of discussion both with uh, both at the scouting combine in Indy in February and then at the owners' meetings at the end of March in Orlando with Brian Gutekunst with regard to Jordan Love and a new contract. It sounds like something's in the works the Packers are going Packers and Jordan loves folks are going to work towards something here it can't be nothing can be finalized signed whatever until after the first few days of May because of the 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 12 month rule with regard to um, contracts because the Packers signed Jordan love to a contract extension in the first week of May last year so there's no, there's no rush here, and certainly the draft is coming up, so a lot of attention is on that. And I think very quickly after the draft, my guess is that attention will turn to this Jordan Love contract, and that's going to get done. Um, but uh, um, you know, the Packers obviously are going are making the long-term commitment to Jordan Love for uh, for obvious reasons, and uh, you know, it could be uh, could be a fun few years around here with uh, with that young man continuing to grow and develop as he's done. You want to win a championship. And, and Jordan, there are things that he's going to want back from that first year as a starter, and it goes back to even that game against the 49ers. But I think if you're looking outside of just the Super Bowl and the Lombardi, it was having confidence that you found your guy. And I felt like the 2023 campaign gave us that confidence. I felt like that final stretch of the season, Mike, I would challenge you to find me a better quarterback those last six, seven weeks of the regular season than Jordan Love. He was exceptional yep. in every facet of the game. And a big reason why the Green Bay Packers were able to mount that rally and a big reason why they were able to get in the playoffs and ultimately have this, this uh, sort of excitement now heading into this year two uh, at, with him as QB1. I don't know how the dollars and cents work out. It's actually been a, a minute since we've had to do like a true like quarterback extension. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Rodgers had a few of them there down the end, but I mean, ultimately it was mostly just kind of reworking a few things. Uh, this reminds me a lot of what Aaron got when we got into 2013. Uh, when, when he, you know, he did that first deal with Green Bay, I think in what was at the end of the eight season. It was, yeah, they, they, they extended Aaron Rodgers in the middle of the 2008 yep. season, his first year as the starters, eight or nine games in, and then he got his, his first uh you know, sort of his official second contract. And I don't know if you remember that, but that 2012 season, it just seemed like that was something where he was constantly being asked about it. Hey, are you playing under value your contract or whatever? Yeah. And then ultimately after the Joe Flacco deal, the Packers made him the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. 
I don't know how that's all going to work out with Jordan Love, but you just feel so happy for him from a personal perspective because this is a guy that, in addition to putting in the time, in addition to developing and putting this all to good use, he led that locker room with a very even keel temperament. He's never blinked. He's never talked out of line. He's been the consummate professional and leader I feel like this locker room needs him to be in. The one thing that Matt LaFleur mentioned that he wants him to work on, that's the big point of emphasis going into year two now, there is no Aaron Jones. There, you know, they, they, there is a, still a young offense, but there's fewer of those leaders on that side of the ball. More is going to be asked of Jordan in that way, and I think that's exciting. I think that's an opportunity he's going to relish in understanding that this is my football team, and you are not on Instagram. You could care less about Instagram, <laughs> but Jordan had a post a couple days ago, and I don't even know how many likes it ended up getting. I don't know how many views it ended up getting. It's a lot, though. And all it was was Jordan looking with his back to the camera, looking out to the Lambeau Field fans, and just saying, missing this. Yeah. These fans are excited for the season. Jordan's excited for the season. And number 10 is going to be here for a long time. Well, speaking of the season, the full schedule for 2024 has not been released, and that will happen uh, presumably a couple weeks after the draft, so roughly about a month from now, four weeks from now, something like that. But the Packers know game one. They do. Week one. It will be on the Friday night after the Thursday night kickoff opener, which presumably will be in Kansas City with the Chiefs hosting, the Super Bowl champion Chiefs hosting a game at Arrowhead. But on the next night, on Friday night, the Packers will be in Sao Paulo, Brazil (laughs) to face the Philadelphia Eagles. This is technically a home game for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Packers are the road team. We just found out about this last week, Wes, and I am not exactly looking forward to a 12 hour flight to go cover a football game. That will definitely be a first for me, but your thoughts on this whole Brazil thing. This is just, this is kind of, it kind of came out of nowhere in a lot of respects. And that's why I laugh. I don't laugh for any other reason other than for so long, even going back to my days at the press Gazette, it was like, boy, when are the Packers going to go to London? And it's like, okay, well, they finally went. Now we're going to South America. We're going to play the first ever game in South America. Less than two, I guess it'd be 23 months after the uh, trip to London. Like, here, go go to Brazil. Fly (laughs) fly twice as far away. Yeah, you were talking about what's going to happen. That's probably the closest you and I are ever going to come to having throwing blows, um, (laughs) throwing down, um, coming to blows. But, no... I, here, here's the thing, Mike. You know my stance on this. I was really against it, only from the standpoint of what the travel is and the fact that you open the season with such a taxing trip. Yep. But I have to give credit to the Brazilian fans and honestly, South American Packers fans, because we've gotten things in insider inbox oh, from yeah. people from Argentina, from Uruguay, people that are going to make this trip just because they're in the region. Absolutely. And I, get, I have so much respect for them because you can feel their fandom. This isn't just, oh, some novelty. The Packers are going to go down there and, yeah, 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 let's go check it out. No, these are people that live and breathe football just like John out in Wausau does. And this is, for them, potentially a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I don't think we're going to be going to Brazil every other year. <laughs> so no. for us to be able to make that trip, you appreciate – what it means culturally you appreciate what it means for the national football league to put jordan love and this football team on display like they are but more importantly it is about expanding this game and and i don't know how many more years you're going to do this i said i always have about 19 left give or take (laughs) i'm going to see a lot of different parts of this country but parts of this globe if i stick around and if the packers don't want to let me go and hand me a pink slip i don't know if i'll ever be in brazil again from a vacation standpoint or a work standpoint. So from that aspect, I'm really embracing it, but it is going to be very interesting to see how both of these teams come out of it. Cause it is something unlike anything else. I think uh, the NFL has really tried so far. Yeah. And logistically, the only reason, you know, this really is even a possibility to do in week one is because of the change of a few years ago of going to just the three preseason games where there's essentially a, you know, kind of an off week in terms of playing games. There's no longer that fourth preseason game before week one. So because that gap is in there, the NFL sort of looks at the calendar and goes, Oh yeah, well let's send let's send a couple of teams on a long road trip because it's uh, because it's certainly more doable now than it would have been a few years ago. You know what this feels like? It feels like when uh, you get the call from like, uh, I don't know, pick a, 
pick your cable company or you know some type of telemarketing thing where they offer you like the first three months and then you end up getting hit with something on the other end of it. A couple of years ago, the NFL is like, hey, we're gonna take, we're gonna get rid of that last preseason game. Everything's <laughs> cool. We'll add the other regular season game, but everything's cool. And now we're already chipping back into right. that off time before week <laughs> one again. Exactly. It's like you got me again. <laughs> yeah. You know. That is, that is exactly what this feels like. Well, hey. I know a lot of people are fired up about the draft. There's plenty to discuss with regard to the draft. And now that we have reviewed the offseason, we will shift into draft mode. We have another show later this week. We will have another one next week also prior to the draft. And we'll try to look at this 2024 NFL draft from all angles. So be sure to tune in for that. But until then, for Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time.